So what's it like working in a family business? And what's it like losing that job in the family business? The gentleman next to us has an interesting tale to tell us in a brand new book about it. It's called Recovering Leadership. We welcome into the Oklahomans video studio, Mr. Thomas Hill III. Good to see you, sir. David, thank you very much. It's good to be here. It's very nice to meet you. Uh, I, I mentioned as we were chatting earlier, uh, I remember being on the Kimray campus uh, in northeast Oklahoma City, I believe, a few years ago. And it's an impressive operation. Let's start right there. What is Kimray? What's the family business? Because it is a family-owned operation. Well, I'm glad we went back to that because you kind of opened with me getting fired, which is, you know, a really difficult way to open an interview. You gotta hook people, though, right? I mean, come on. So, (laughs) yeah. So, and and then I should follow it up with uh, today's, and you won't believe what happened next, (laughs) right? Well, that really is kind of the point of the book: is that miracles do happen. But uh, Kimray was founded in 1948 by my grandfather, Garmin Kimmel. And he had been involved in the oil and gas business as a design engineer and and understood the necessity for the products that we currently make. And so he started this company, uh, developed and and, uh, introduced into the industry a piloted pressure regulator. A glycol circulation pump. And I may not be saying that word right at all, but that's kind of what I remember from seeing on the campus. That was kind of revolutionary. Yeah, the energy exchange glycol pump uh, was revolutionary, still is. There's still very few people who actually understand exactly how it works. (laughs) Garmin was a genius. Well, don't ask me. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll explain it to you later. Okay, great. <laughs> so, and so over over the years, um, you know, Kimray got a reputation for producing an outstanding product. It works. It allowed people to control the production at the well site in a way that was necessary to get better separation of the fluids that come out of the ground. So it improved production, which improves their 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 price on on the oil and gas. And so all around it was a win. And over the years, we got a reputation for being a company that you could count on, that you could trust. We always do what we say we'll do. We take care of our products. We take care of our customers. Good prices, good service, you know, just the kind of things that, that people want in partners in business. And, and so I grew up in that atmosphere. I grew up in that business. My father went to work for the company uh, in the very early 70s, right after he got out of college. I uh, went to college on the GI Bill after serving in Vietnam as a Marine. Very nice. And, uh, and that's another piece of my story. You know, I grew up in a household. My dad's a Marine, and my grandfather's an entrepreneur and a genius, and my dad's pretty bright and has patents. And so very high-functioning, sure. uh, very rigid uh, family. I believe your dad uh, wrote the Ford in the book. He did. He, he says did. right off the top, I'm a Taipei personality. <laughs> yeah. He, he, he admits his faults, as we all do these days. We're not going to say really, that's a fault at yeah, all. Yeah, we're getting really good at, at, at acknowledging that, that there are some problems uh, in our family. But So growing up in that environment, uh, I learned uh, early that uh, accomplishment was what mattered. Nobody ever actually said that to me. I don't want to give people the impression that you know I was abused as a child. I had a great, <laughs> great childhood, but I grew up around these men who were always right, could always fix things. I never saw them uncertain or afraid or wrong. My, my father and my grandfather were not ever wrong. And so you grew up. In cheek, but, you grew up believing that. And I and I thought that's what it meant to be a man. And so I set out okay. to try to do that. And that creates a problem because that's not really true. We we do have insecurities. We are wrong. We don't always have the answer. We don't always we're know human, what we're doing. Right? We are. And uh, and so that created a lot of problems for me. And I dealt with those problems by really just investing myself in accomplishing more and more. And so I I became accomplishment oriented and. The beautiful thing about our society is I got rewarded for that, right? right. So this was actually an, a, an inappropriate response. It was not healthy for me. I was not developing in a healthy way, and yet I won awards and got accolades. And then by the time I was adult, you get in the newspaper and you get awards and you get all kinds of things. So I had society lots of help. Society sees you as being, hey, he's productive. I, yeah, people would often ask me, I don't know how you get so much done. And now I, now I can tell them, well, you do that by killing yourself. <laughs> and it's not healthy and you really don't want to go there. It's a bit of there. a downside as it turns out. And that ends up being a treadmill that, that I think a lot of people get on. I, I believe that there are a lot of people who are struggling with their own identity, uh, where, that, where their value comes from, where their sense of worth comes from. Well, that's but though, right? I was also dealing with a lot of other pain. My family didn't know how to do trauma. We didn't know how to do loss. And so we just kind of said, ah, you know, big boys don't cry, get up and go, go on with it. And so over the years, um, just had a lot of internal issues, a lot of, of instability in my mental and emotional health, and began to find 
ways to medicate myself through all these behaviors, performance type behaviors and just compulsive behaviors. And uh, eventually it, it caught up with me. And so 2012, one uh, Friday morning, I got called into in front of the board. And because of lots of things that had happened, many of which included I really wasn't doing my job anymore because I was so focused on all these other things that were keeping me alive internally, um, was asked to step down and, and leave the company. And the board's role is they have to look out for the best interests of the company, right? They do. Their, their responsibility is not like, to any one like individual. Any Absolutely. It's, it's to the company and, and, and really I was not leading the company uh, healthily. Uh, we, had, we had not jettisoned our, core, jettisoned our core values, but we had lost a lot of what it meant to be Kim Ray because of my leadership, because of the dysfunctional way that I was leading the company. And so the board stepped in, put my father back in as CEO. I stepped out. Um, it's pretty tra traumatic to lose your job. That's the only career I'd ever had. So really uh, a, a long career kind of over in 15 minutes. And that led to uh, a day of, of soul searching and talking to a counselor and my wife. And at the end of the day, um, we realized that I really needed to take some time and, and find a way to get healthy. And so I actually went away for treatment for a while and, and began to learn all the different reasons that I was uh, performing the way I was performing and doing the things I was doing. But I learned something really, really important in that, in that process. I learned that my value wasn't generated by what I did. It was intrinsic to me that, that I have value as a human being, just like you do. And there's a problem if, if I believe that I'm valuable because of what I do, then what do you think I believe about you? Sure. That you're valuable for what you do, right? So if you don't perform well, I'm going to devalue you. I may not say that out loud, but, right. but I really do. And that was what was dysfunctional about our leadership at Kimray. So I came back from that experience really with a completely different belief system and believing that I would never be part of Kimray again. So started another company with a friend of mine, was, was heading in a different direction and trying to make up for lost time with my family. And, and the board called me and said, hey, we really would like to talk to you about coming back to Kimray. And so I had an opportunity to come back in uh, just about a year after I left. A lot of things had changed. The board stepped in and kind of dismantled a lot of the stuff that I had created and that was unhealthy and um, was catering to my needs and not really helping the company or the employees or our customers. And so a lot of the things that I felt like would have to be true were already there. And I stepped back in in a much lesser role, which was an interesting thing to do. And then over the next few years, uh, demonstrated that, that I was living in a healthy way and leading in a healthy way. And a couple of years ago, actually almost three years ago, they reinstalled me as CEO. The thing that's important about our story is not really me, it's what has happened to Kim Ray. Because now that we have a foundational belief, the organization has a belief that people are intrinsically valuable, it changes everything that we do. And our people understand that their value is intrinsic, comes, comes with them, and they're free to perform from a position of they're not competing for their value. They're not competing to get on top of somebody else. Everybody at Kimberly has the same value. Everybody at Kimberly gets the same respect. And it has completely transformed the way it feels to be at Kimray. And really the best part of the book is the end of the book because we talk about what it feels like to come to work at Kimray and, and The culture is different. Yeah, the culture is completely different. I want to back up and go through that discovery process you went through there because I, I, I think anyone who goes through loss, whether it's uh, a job loss or a divorce or a death in the family or, or friend for that matter, there's a bit of a discovery process of who am I and what do I do now? What was it like for you? Uh, it was terrifying. Um, the, the day after I lost my job, I didn't know who I was. I really didn't know what I was going to do because all my life I had been associated with Kim Ray. I had been management at Kim Ray. Part I of had, your identity. Th that was my identity. And I really didn't know who I was going to be or what I was going to do. Um, so that is, that is a, a significant thing. I think people deal with that differently, sure. and I had a lot of things kind of cycle through my emotions and, and, and my mental state. Luckily, I was surrounded by and had access to people who helped me with that. Um, 
I think that a lot of times people find themselves alone in those moments, and I think that can be very, very devastating for them. One, one of the things that I hope the book will help with is that maybe a leader or even somebody who isn't, isn't currently in a high-profile high leadership role will see some of the things that they're currently experiencing in their life and change direction without having to go all the way to the end of that road and have that you know, very significant and devastating thing happen to them. Unfortunately, for a lot of people who have addictive behavior, it takes that kind of interruption. We call that an intervention. That's to get something has to be in the road and keep you from driving forward. Otherwise, we just keep going. How important do you think uh, counseling is? I still see a therapist every yeah. other week, and I probably will for the rest of my life. I, you know, every time I don't feel good, I call my doctor to see if there's something wrong with me. I don't think that I can heal myself, and they won't allow me to prescribe medicine for myself. So I, I utilize a doctor for my physical health. Uh, when I am gaining weight and not performing the way I want to physically, I go, go get somebody to help me with my workouts or partner up with somebody. In almost every aspect of our lives, we readily and actively seek professional help uh, to, to help us get well or help us improve, except a lot of times for our mental and emotional health. You think health. that's a stigma? I do, that and I think we, like, I think we need to talk about it more. I think, and that's another, that's another thing that I'm willing to do. I'm willing to be one of the CEOs that stands up and says, I've been to therapy, you know, I've been to inpatient treatment, I go to therapy, I couldn't live without it. It's part of my life, it's part of how I do, you know, do what I do. Um, any more than I would stop seeing my dentist or stop going in for checkups. Um, very, very important. You mentioned the, uh, the task-oriented mentality. Uh, there's a need for that task-oriented mentality, and I would think in a business such as yours where you're producing product, uh, that's kind of important. It is. Um, we, we need people to accomplish the things that are put before them. Uh, what seems to be true, though, is that when people are performing out of a position of safety and out of a position where they know that they're valued and that they're not struggling to gain that value, they actually perform better than when they're performing out of fear that they're going to get displaced or lose their position or somebody else is going to get in front of them. And so what we have found is not that we have a lower performance at Kimray. In fact, we are breaking records in almost every measurable aspect of our business. We have higher margins, higher profitability, higher productivity, more uh, innovation going on in the shop floor, more continuous improvement, more interaction between groups. The silos are going away because, again, nobody is building their own value out of, out of their own knowledge. They don't have to protect what they know and what they do in order to retain their value. We value them. We demonstrate that in, in a hundred ways. We talk about a lot of different ways that that happens in the book. Uh, and, and then they are literally free. I can't say that enough. We have freed them to perform from a position of security and they do much better. They flourish in that type of a situation. And so didn't do it so that the company would be more profitable, but it works out that way. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit. We're looking at some footage, and this is probably some dated footage uh, at this point of one of the buildings you have on your campus at this point. Uh, technology has probably revolutionized your industry quite a bit, and to the point where you're talking about the employees need to produce, let's say, 80 widgets, for example. Uh, perhaps now technology allows a robot to do that, but to your point, that gives you two things, efficiency and safety. That's correct. We, uh, we're striving to replace the repetitive and potentially dangerous jobs with automation so that instead of a person being the one who puts a part in a machine and takes the part out, you know, you do that enough times over, over your career, you're going to get hurt. So we're trying to remove the exposure to that injury and, and have a robot maybe load that machine and the person manages the system. And so the person is monitoring the, the variables in the system and tweaking the system, making sure that everything is running appropriately. It's a job that requires more education. It pays better. It's cleaner. It's more interesting. The, the things you do every day are more variable. All of these things I think are better for people than you know, just being the guy who does the same thing a, a thousand times a day. But as CEO running a company, it's probably expensive to implement more robotics, for example? It, it, there is a cost associated with that. Um, 
and I'm not going to tell you that, that we're spending money that we're not going to get any return on investment on. We're finding that there's a return on investment. It's just smart business but to do that. Quite frankly, we often make decisions where the first consideration is the impact it will have on our community, which first of all is our internal community, the people who actually live and work at Kimray. But we're also interested in how we impact Oklahoma City, the state, and then even the nation. And so we're looking as a manufacturer, you know, what, how does what we do change manufacturing in the United States, certainly in the state of Oklahoma. But my number one concern is, is what's it like to be a member of our family at Kimray and, and are the people that are working at Kimray um, able to find meaning in their work? Can they connect to our mission? Uh, our mission is to make a difference in the lives of the people that we serve. Has nothing to do, our mission has nothing to do with making valves or even making money, although we do those things and we do them well. Our, our mission is to, is to change the world and we demonstrate to our team on almost a daily basis how what they do impacts the community. The money that we make, we spend part of that in the community. We give a lot of money away. We support things, and we get our people involved in those things. And so they come to work every day not thinking, i got to get one more valve out the door today, but thinking, if we make another dollar today, we're going to change somebody else's lives, and including theirs. So that's, that's very important to us. And again, it's, we do that because it is absolutely true that those people are valuable to us. They're just as valuable. Those people are just as valuable as I am. Chatting with Thomas Hill III, he's the CEO of Kimray. The book is Recovering Leadership. Um, why that title? Well, when you're in treatment, one of the things that you often come to the realization is you don't know, I don't know anybody that wouldn't benefit from being in recovery. <laughs> Everybody I know has got issues that, that the kinds of processes that you go through in recovering from the kinds of things that I was struggling with I think would benefit everybody. I think that leadership in and of itself is a extremely challenging place to be and it's e we see so much failure in leadership all around us and it seems to be accelerating not not getting better. I think that that is understandable given the pressure that leaders are under and the kinds of things that they have access to. And so I believe that we need to start a movement to literally recover true leadership, servant leadership. I think when we do that, then we'll recover our cultures and our communities. I tell people, I get asked to speak on culture. What they really want to know is they want to know how to change their culture, and they're not happy with my response because I say, if you want a different culture, you need a different leader, you need a different belief system in your organization because you will, you will organically create the culture that naturally follows your belief system. And so we need to, we need to get to the leaders in, in, in our nation, in our city, in our state, with the message that it's their, them changing themselves is what's going to change their cultures and how they can do that. Well, let me ask you about that. Again, the, the title of the book is uh, Recovering Leadership, uh, but then it says right here, Musings of an Addict, uh, an Addict Leader. What do you mean by that? And perhaps what should people be looking for as, as a leader? Well, uh, addiction takes a lot of different forms, but it always uh, has as a component a, a selfishness. The person, an, an addict, is a selfish person. Um, they are primarily interested in their own comfort, and they're orchestrating and, and manipulating their environment to make themselves feel better. And that's true whether you've got a drug addict who's stealing money from their parents to get their next fix. They'll do a lot of things that they would never have thought they would do. or it's a leader who finds himself or herself in a position of power and now has the ability to have people serve them and meet their needs in ways that might not be beneficial to the organization as a whole and they end up creating conflict and all kinds of cultural issues in their organization. And so uh, I believe that a lot of leadership behaves like addicts whether they actually have a diagnosable addiction or not and that addictive behavior has fallout in their community and their culture. So I'm calling people to acknowledge that they have these behaviors, acknowledge that, that they have a tendency toward these things, and commit to, to fix those things. I believe it's our sacred duty. The musings part is uh, a couple of years before I actually got uh, pushed into writing the book, um, I started writing uh, once a week a musing and sending it to my leadership team because I wanted them to be part, I wanted them to be in, in my process. I wanted them to know the things I was thinking about, the things I was writing about. I journal a lot. 
the things that were interesting me and, and how it was connecting things because every once in a while leaders just show up and they say, hey, we're going to change this over here and nobody knows like how we got from? there. Yeah. So I wanted them to be part of that process and I began putting these out and there are a number of them, quite a number of them interspersed throughout the book uh, just with, that gives people a flavor of, of kind of the development of the thought processes. And Is that similar to uh, what I see on your website and the blog? Yes, yes. And, and so those are online, available for okay. anybody that wants to look at them. Uh, it's recoveringleadership.com, and they're, in, they're in, in order. I write them to my team, and so a lot of times we reference specific things that are going on at Kim Ray or going on in our lives, but they're written in a way that I don't mind if anybody in the world would read them. There's nothing secret in there. We'll wrap this up. <clears throat> Why write a book? Will there be more books? Yeah, two, did, you, did you enjoy writing two, a book? Two great questions. I actually did. In, in Looking back, I'm, I'm very glad that we wrote the book. I'm very glad to have gone through the process. I resisted writing the book for a long time. I, I, I was asked if I would write a book, and people thought I should write a book. I've been telling the story now for a number of years, and every time I tell the story, whether it's a group of students or a group of leaders, there's, there, there's an impact. Somebody or a number of people will come up and say, oh, you know, I, I saw something of myself in that, or I, I really appreciate you sharing that. And so get, getting the opportunity to do that more often was important to me. Having a book, being an author was not important to me, but I was convinced by other people that that would open more doors. And so uh, last November, I, I, I literally kind of got bullied into writing the book and agreed to do it and uh, really couldn't, couldn't have done it without the team, the publisher, uh, my own team at Kim Ray, uh, my executive administrator, Robert Greenlaw. I, I couldn't have written the book without him. And we really just sat down and did it. And it was actually uh, therapeutic, cathartic, if you want, for me. Um, I'm glad it's there. I'm glad it's out there. It's, it's, a, it's an opportunity for a lot of people to, to get the story that I won't ever get to talk to. Who among your family were you a little bit hesitant for them to read this, or was there anybody? Well, I let like, everybody boom, read it story. before. Yeah, I let everybody read it before. I don't. I don't really think that I was hesitant for anybody, okay. um, because again, I've been telling the story, and we're we're pretty open at Kimray about what happened at Kimray, and I'm very open about my life, and I believe that transparency is a is a absolute necessity for authentic leadership, and so we're very transparent at Kimray. Um, so I, I wasn't too worried about anybody reading it. I did give my immediate family, my wife and my parents and my kids, the right to ask me to change or remove anything in the original manuscript. And, and they did make a couple of changes and made them more comfortable with the way I had presented some of the information. But by and large, what you see is what we wrote. So, um, I guess I need to ask you this. What's, uh, what's next for Kim Ray? What's next for Kim Ray? Because you well, guys went through what a lot of uh, industry, uh, corporations, businesses in the oil and gas energy industry went through. It's the up and downness, and right now it looks like things are coming back, but it's a volatile industry. The, the last downturn was by far the worst that the industry has seen, probably forever, but certainly for a long, long time. It was deeper and it was longer, and we really had no way of predicting when we were going to come out of it. Um, we did make it through. A lot of companies didn't. We're very, very pleased that we that we were able to do that. Our, our people were, were awesome during that. Um, we're in much stronger company now. We have better margins, better performance, better everything. And it's time for us to kind of go to the next level for Kimray. Before the downturn, we were kicking around building a building. We have some property. Um, we're now back on that strong. We're okay. going to get that done. I'm going to consolidate. We're currently in 16 buildings spread over a number of streets and just kind of grew over the years. And that's wonderful, but it, it has limited us in a lot of ways that I, that I would like to remove. And so we're actively uh, getting ready to build a building and, and create a new campus. I think that's going to be really significant in the, in the next few years development for our culture, for our people. Uh, but I also think it'll be significant just in terms of our processes. We will have the space and the ability to lay out our processes in a way that will allow us to continue to improve our efficiencies and support our customers and take care of our people. And that's what we're all about. So we're excited about that. Well, very good. I've enjoyed the conversation. You can find more information about Kim Ray. Their website, as I turned out, is right there, KimRay.com, the standalone valve controller right in front of you. The other website, recoveringleadership.com, to learn more about the blog, the book, 
which you can also purchase many places, including Amazon.com. I need to ask you the uh, audio book. Is that your voice? I haven't listened to it yet. Is that you? Or... It is. I, okay. I read I read for the audio book. How was, was, that? was that? Well, that was an amazing experience. It, it turns out that it's a lot harder to read something you wrote word for word than you would think it was. <laughs> And so I messed up a lot, and I also, I, 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 I'm not committing to write another book. I do not want to be a serial <laughs> author, but if I ever write another book, I will use less large words, because <laughs> we messed up a lot of the large words. But it was a lot of fun, a lot of time in the studio, but again, I had a fantastic team, very supportive, and I, I kind of look at all of those things these days as, as just opportunities for me to grow and experience things, so I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. Cool. I've enjoyed the conversation. Thomas Hill III, good to meet you, and uh, David, thanks for your thank time you. today. Thank Appreciate you it. Too.